pray. We are in Mark, and you thought we might be able to finish the book tonight, but I'm sure we are not going to. We are going to go uh, mainly the verses 1 through 8 of Mark chapter 16, uh, and I'll read them here in the NIV. The English Standard is on the notes. Um, we're going to come to verse 9 and just get it you know, pointed out right away. That's why we're stopping in verse 8, because in verse 9, you probably have a line drawn, or in, you know, unless you've got like a, a King James of some sort. Uh, there's, they're going to say in my NIV, not that we agree with this, but it is in the text, it says, parentheses, most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses, meaning witnesses, meaning manuscripts, uh, uh, excuse me, manuscripts would be, uh, when it says early manuscripts and other witnesses would be people like the church fathers who are quoting scripture and when they, when they make a point, they'll go back and use a scripture reference. Those would be witnesses to the scriptures and what they're using. They don't quote these verses uh, early on, they say. Uh, and other early or ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. So we'll talk about that next week. And it is one thing to uh, uh, discuss that and say, hmm, looks like someone added that. And you're going to see right here when we finish, when we get to verse 8 and we say, that's the end of the book of Mark, you're going to be like, what? And so the option would be, one, is it's typical of Mark. He kind of leaves it just kind of hanging uh, it, there's some omission. He doesn't really describe in great detail the resurrection. You're just kind of left, left, left with this. There's a young man in a white garment sitting in the tomb. And he t- says, go, go tell the disciples Jesus has risen. And they're like, they're scared and they run off and they don't tell anyone. And Mark. And it's kind of like, well, what happens? And again, the point there would be he's leaving it in the hands of the readers. Now, how are you going to respond to this? Uh, and that's an, a nice concept, but where do, what about these other verses? Uh, well, some say, would say they came by later and tried to add them uh, to kind of give the book a nice closing. Some would say Mark wrote the first edition and sent it off and then came back and added this to kind of close the book down. And so you got the first edition, the second edition, Mark, and some Bibles are copying the first edition. Some are copying the second edition. Uh, there's, we'll talk more about it in detail uh, next week. But if you look on the bo- back page of your notes, uh, just to kind of give you a preview, it's not all that clear. Bo- bottom of page five, you've got some ancient codex. Uh, the codex would be uh, not scrolls, but scrolls where they began to cut the scrolls in sections and then sew them together and make a codex we call it a book and so they used to make you know just scrolls and then they decided well instead of having to roll through the scroll let's just take the scroll cut it in sections sew it together so we can like flip through the you know like we know a book to be and so the codex uh the codex sinaiticus and codex vaticanus they're called codex alpha codex b like in your footnote your appendix of your greek text they tell you where they get it uh, both Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus from 325 to 350 to the middle of 300s A.D., they do not have, they stop it, the book sta- stops at chat, verse 8. Uh, but there are other Codex, and these Codex are so early that they're not the minuscule letters, they're the capital letters. Like if you go on a Greek uh, a college campus and you see letters on a, on a fraternity house, those are the capital letters. But when you read a Greek manuscript, they're the small letters. The difference would be, uh, the difference in English would be A, B, C, and then it would be A, you know, maybe a B, C, like this. This is how our Greek manuscripts are written. These are called the minuscule. These are called the unsealed. These are, are the, the earliest way they wrote are just block letters. And then they would just fill in a line, come back, fill in a line, come back, fill in. And you wouldn't even stop and break for a word. You may have a word and just finish it here. You would have punctuation. be lines of words. These Codex Vaticanus are so old that they are written like this. Then as you get into the 400s, 500s, Uh, they begin to write the manuscripts so that the scribes could write a little bit quicker. They make the letters smaller, make it more cursive, and that's what you see 
when you read Greek letters today, like in a Greek manuscript. And so these would be the older manuscripts, or more recent manuscripts. I mean, not like, you know, 1800s, but, you know, like 500, 600, 900 A.D. And so some of the earlier manuscripts, the uncials, don't have it. Uh, but on the other point, uh, point three at the bottom there, the majority of the old manuscripts, especially when you get into the minuscules, they've all got these verses. And even, uh, here's, the, here's really one of the, I'll give you two things that, that you know, I, I don't mind saying, hmm, maybe this was added. Because the Bible does say, Revelation gives you the warning, do not add to or take away from the Word of God. So it's like, well, we don't want to take away the Word of God. Right, but you also don't want to add to it. You know, like, no one wants to tear out a chapter out of Revelation and say this doesn't stay there, because that would be violating Scripture. Right, but you don't want to add the Book of Mormon to it or something because you're adding to the Scriptures. And so these verses are in the same category. Those that, you know, rally to the Scriptures say, well, I'm a defender of the Scripture, we're going to leave this here. Well, are you violating the Scripture by adding something that shouldn't be there? So you have that, you know, that kind of that double-edged side. And again, some people have come, and I've got an article that I'm, I, I may share with you, or at least I'm going to use it for research, of someone just ripping on people who take these verses and set them aside. And they've got some legitimate academic points, but you can tell it's fueled by, you know, an emotional, uh, almost anger. But nonetheless, for those that accept and want to put these verses, verses 9 to the end of the chapter in the book of Mark here, the last chapter, is the majority of the manuscripts have it. But also look at this. Some early church fathers actually refer to and quote these verses. They are Justin Martyr, uh, Tatian, and Irenaeus. And look at the years. 155 A.D., Justin Martyr is referring to it, Tatian in 170, and Irenaeus in 180 A.D. knows these verses exist. And Irenaeus, you know him from... John the Apostle had a couple apostles, uh, Polycarp, Papias, and Ignatius. Those are guys. Uh, Polycarp could have been the pastor of the church of Smyrna in Revelation. He says, I I write to the church of, of Smyrna. Polycarp would have been there. Papias, Polycarp, and Ignatius. Listen to John teach. John chapter, or uh, second, third John, when John is sending out teachers to churches and they're being rejected and sent back or they're being accepted, he's sending out Polycarp, Papias, Ignatius, or their contemporaries. They'd come back and learn from John and go back out. So these are the second generation. Well, Ignatius taught Irenaeus. And so Irenaeus... Ignatius, Irenaeus. Irenaeus is, you see the year 180 A.D. is quoting these verses at the end of Mark. So you've got, there's something uh, you're going to have to think about. Uh, so there's one case that's saying, well, they, they shouldn't be there, especially when they start putting it in, your, in footnotes right in the text. But then there's another thing. It's like, well, yeah, but Irenaeus knew about these verses. Uh, I'll say one more thing. Uh, And I've used this before, but I've checked it. In fact, if you go on right there, if you want to see, this is cool. You may like this. If uh, you want to see Codex Sinaiticus, it's it's from, it may be when Constantine became emperor and Christianized the nation and made Christianity legal, he commissioned at government expense that 50 Bibles be written. And they would have been written in the uncial, uh, the capital letter form. They would have been large books, you know, you know thick, because they're, they're write, you know, writing them uh, in 325 A.D. Uh, this Codex Sinaiticus may be one of those 50 that has just survived. And then there's Codex Vaticanus. Nonetheless, I've got a link right here. You can't see it on here, but the notes are online underneath the, f- the live feed on the generationword.com homepage. Click on notes there, and they'll be, on, they'll be online also with this. Uh, the the uh, the podcast and the and the video, but if you click on that, that will take you to a digital. The Bible is di- it's digital. You can you can click through every and you can zoom in on it. You can if you're a Greek scholar and you and you wanted to like go back and see what is really written there. You can zoom in on it and look at you know it's you can see the the picture. 
but you can zoom into the letters where you're looking at the letters like this on your computer screen and examining what actually does that word say, how did they form this letter. You can, it's very well done for both Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm under the impression that many of you are going to rush home tonight and zoom in and examine the actual textual writings of these, but it is pretty cool that you can go back and see from the days of Constantine, from the days that Christianity was just becoming legal in the Roman Empire, you know, 325, 350, some of the great, well, 1,700-year-old Bible, and it would include the Old Testament, some of the Apocrypha, uh, and the New Testament. But nonetheless, you can click on those. So that's something that's coming up here uh, next week, and is always a, a topic of discussion in Mark chapter 16. Okay, well now, Mark 16, verses 1 through 8, that are, again, uh, the Word of God and Mark's account. And uh, it, you, you're, you know the story, the Easter story, the resurrection story. We got it in Matthew. We got it in Mark, Luke, and John. But you're going to notice right in here how much Mark does not say, how many details are left out. Uh, he's definitely focused on some things, but there's some things that's just, why doesn't he, he say these things? Again, I don't think he, he it's, it's a mistake. I think he's writing with a certain style, and he's probably recording what Peter had taught him that, that we've talked about. Nonetheless, Mark 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Now, what you're noticing several things here is uh, they're, they're going to be unprepared because, again, Jesus was buried on Friday. They couldn't work on Saturday, the Sabbath. Now they're up early in the morning trying to throw together some spice because he's been in the tomb now going on the third day. Uh, the body's going to start decaying, start smelling, and they got to get in there. And for that first year, while it sits there in the tomb decaying, they want to make it as pleasant as possible. Uh, and, and they're going to prepare. They're going to buy the spices, get it ready to go. And they are not thinking, again, th th it's going to be pointed out to them, it's just as Jesus said. He has risen. It, he said, Jesus said, at, at, up at Caesarea Philippi, after three days, I'll rise again. He told the disciples several times, and I will rise again. Uh, he, he referred to scriptures. Uh, they, they, well, I don't want to say they should have, but they could have latched on to that. But it was so foreign, and you've experienced it yourself just in natural conversations. Someone says something that you completely aren't anticipating, and so you don't even hear or understand what they said. Uh, we can talk about marital relations right here. The wife says, here's what I'm going to do. You're not even listening. She does exactly what she says, and you're like, well, I didn't know you are going to do that. Well, I told you. I left a note. I put text message you, and you didn't pick up your phone. Well, that, they, so, I mean, it's kind of, you could say supernatural, but that's a very natural. Jesus is going to be coming back from the dead, someone no one has ever done before. And in fact, I mean, not just being, you know, resuscitated, or a, a ghost, he's going to have gone into death, gone through death, and come back in a resurrected state, conquering death. No one ever has done this. So uh, they're not even thinking these things. They're thinking about who's going to move the stone. we got to get the spices. Uh, and they say, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been pushed there by Joseph of Arimathea when he closed, and they watched him close the tomb, had been rolled away. And so it's like, oh, the stone's been rolled away. So now it's like, why? What has happened? Someone, like, in, you know, they, they nailed Jesus, they mocked Jesus, they whipped Jesus. Now what, they stole his body and, you know, put up on a pole or they burnt it? What, what, what have they done to Jesus? So they, they step into the tomb maybe expecting to see a dead body or a stolen body or a, you know, a desecrated body or, or something. Instead, they walk in and they entered the tomb and they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Now notice again what Mark does not say. And they saw an angel. Matthew talks about it. Luke talks about it. It's throughout the, uh, the, the, the Easter story. 
They just go in and see a young man in a white robe sitting on the tomb. Or on, on the, we'll just see a picture of it here again of the burial bench just sitting there. Again, notice Mark doesn't cross that line and go right into the supernatural. He's like, well, the stone's rolled away. Well, Mark or Matthew will give you the details of why the stone was rolled, how the stone was rolled away. They just go, the stone's rolled away. Oh, there's a man inside the tomb with a white robe on. And he says, and of course, they, it says they were alarmed. He says, don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene. Again, Jesus the Nazarene, the man from Nazareth. I mean, you're looking for Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, who's been resurrected from the dead. Ah, oh, you're looking for the guy from uh, Nazareth, Jesus. You know, very low down, very normal, very natural, but yet it's, the, the supernatural is just echoing all around it. And again, Mark is writing like this intentionally. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? That's his evidence. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, quote, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Pretty simple. The women's response, verse 8, or at least Mark's recording of the women's response, trembling and bewildered the women went out and fled from the tomb they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid which again it's like well why didn't they, are they doubting why aren't they it's like they're they're this doesn't even make sense this is totally not what they were expecting it wasn't even an option and this guy they just ran away they were trembling bewildered meaning not doubting not turning away from god but it's like what what was he talking about who who was that where's the body who moved the stone where's the disciples and they said nothing to anyone probably because they they don't know how to say it. what are you going to say oh peter uh we were supposed to tell you that jesus will meet you in galilee i mean what the, the disciples are hot are hot are all hiding uh the women don't know what just happened and the message is go to galilee and jesus will see you there but he's dead and his body's missing. What? what? Go tell them what. And they just said nothing to anyone. He'd say, well, they, they're not being a faithful witness. They don't even understand what they're supposed to be saying because they were afraid, bewildered, totally lost. And that would be in, again, one, the first way of looking at this, that's the end of the book of Mark. Now, some will criticize that, say, well, that's a terrible way to end the gospel. But all read, again, I, I'm not going to go either one way or the other on this. I, I, sometimes I favor one, sometimes I favor the other as far as the next verses. But you, we, we will all, everyone accepts those verses are, are scriptural. But look at what is missing in those verses. Uh, there's, it's all just ver a, a young man, not an angel. The stone's been moved, no indication of how doesn't talk about Jesus being resurrected. Jesus isn't appearing to anybody. It's just like they came, they had to hustle, grab some spices, get ready. Nothing's organized. Nothing's prepared, and they're completely confused. That's a nice way to end the book because, well, you've got the same information those women had. You've got the same information the disciples had. Before you start judging, what do you think of this? And Mark leaves it right there. And it's not like he's... You know, the whole gospel presentation rests with Mark. Uh, he's, he's writing to, potentially, the way we've explained it, to the Roman believers. He's writing to the people of Rome during persecution under Nero's, Nero's reign. They've already got a church. They have already have believers. They're already practicing baptism. They're practicing uh, the communion. They, they've got Paul has been there. Uh, Peter's been there, so they know the story, but this is now his writing. So that would be one way of ending the book. Now, with that information, what would you do? You're facing persecution, and you're confused. You're not sure of all the details. Are you going to be able to endure? Now, we can have the next verses. They're not contra contradictory or anything, uh, but we'll look at those next week, and we'll just take a look at these that we have right here. So going to the page one of the notes, English Standard Version. Uh, when the Sabbath was passed, so again, Friday, 
They were right there uh, as the sun was going down. They saw Joseph Arimathea take Jesus' body down, saw him buy a, a piece of cloth and wrap it, saw him carry the body, lay it in the tomb, and saw him, they were standing at a distance, and saw him roll the stone and shut the tomb. And now everyone's got to go home because the Sabbath now has begun, and it's, you know, that was preparation day. Now they've got a day of doing nothing. So they can't buy spices that night. They can't buy spices during the Sabbath. Somehow they're going to get up and start buying these spices early on, again, Sunday morning. And again, don't think Sunday morning, Christian Sunday morning, time to go to church. Put your best clothes on, go to church. You've got to think the Sabbath, the holy day, was Saturday. So Sunday is your and my, well, I'm retired, so <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh Back in the day when I had a career, Monday or Sunday would be the first day of the week. That's the day you get, you know, you go back to work. So they're getting up on Sunday not to go to church. They're getting up and everybody's going back to work the first day of the week. It's, there's no like two-day weekend. It's, it's back to work on Sunday. So it's the first day of the week uh, that they're going. Let's say buy some spices. And again, without being redundant from last week, I, I do want to point this out, and I, I do want to make a comment about this too, as we talked about last week. Mary of Magdalene, from the city of Magdalene, or Magdala, a Mary, the mother of James, and uh, uh, then Salome, S-O-L, Salome, like this. These are the three. They were there watching at a distance, and uh, the details about these people that we, we've got from last week, Mary, we know where she's from. She's up from a, a fishing city on the, the west coast of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, she followed Jesus in the ministry. Jesus cast seven demons out of her, and she was a follower of Jesus. Uh, like we said last week, the concept that she was a prostitute is not in the text of Scripture. It kind of became a church tradition. She had seven demons in her. Well, what kind of woman was she? Well, she probably was, and then they start filling in the blanks. So that, that whole concept, you know, keep it on the shelf, but I can't give you tech, scripture tech, uh, textual support for that. Uh, she was there, and she's, uh, you know, again, fairly faithful. Uh, Jesus was crucified as a criminal. She's aligning herself with him, going to the tomb. Mary, uh, the mother of James, and uh, yeah, you can see it in the notes we went through this last week, um this mary uh this is her, her her husband is clopas which would be joseph's brother so this is jesus uncle clopas or his father's brother and she is the mother of uh james and joseph but is also and again, this is not James or Joseph that, or Jose Joseph that uh, we're familiar with in Scripture, but is also the mother of one named Simon or Simeon, who is going to be the one who replaces Jesus' brother James as the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Jesus' brothers, James and Jude, Jesus. James and Jude were Mary's first three. He had other brothers. One's name's Joseph. Then he had some sisters that are unnamed. But James became the leader of the church of Jerusalem in the book of Acts when he was pushed off the temple mound, the other side right there, in 63 A.D. and beaten to death, martyred. His cousin, Simeon, became the leader of the church of Jerusalem. And so that Simeon's mother is there with Mary Magdalene, uh, and she had married Joseph, Joseph's brother, Clopas. And so James and Joseph, Simeon, would be Jesus' cousins. Now keep that in mind. And then Salome is the mother of the two disciples we know as James and John. They were uh, the ones who wanted to sit on his right and his left. Salome got involved in that, wanted to make special uh, favors. Salome is Jesus' mother's sister. So this is Mary's sister, or Jesus' aunt. 
So this is his uncle and aunt. This is his aunt through his, his mother's side. And she ma is married to Zebedee, which is the father of James and John. James and John, the sons of Zebedee. These are James and John, Jesus' cousins. So you've got uncle, aunt, aunt, uncle Zebedee. You got cousin James and Joseph. We know nothing about. The Church of Rome did because they're mentioned a couple of times. Simeon, cousin Simeon, who's going to be the leader of the church in Jerusalem and someone coming after him, uh, after James. These guys are all cousins. These guys are brothers. These guys are cousins, right, all in here. Now, one, the point, one of the things, okay, that's who's, that's who's at the tomb. And we know that from last week. But what was interesting, it just kind of, it's, it's right there. It, it's right there. Jesus is the Messiah because he is known as the son of David. He is in the lineage of the royal family of King David. And you've got, in the book of Luke, you've got Mary's genealogy tracing Jesus from Adam through Abraham, all the way through the patriarchs, through David, all the way through the kings, takes a back door, through, uh, not through Solomon, but through Solomon's brother Nathan, all the way up to his, his family here. And Jesus is of the lineage of David. He's directly connected in lineage to King David. Joseph, Clopas's brother, his genealogy is recorded in Matthew coming all the way down. And that goes through Solomon, who goes through uh, the last kings, and they were cut off and said, you know, uh, Jehoiakim, you're going to be cut off. And uh, you do get Zerubbabel coming up from that, but they're, they're going to be cut off and not have any kings any longer on the throne. But they still come through David and Solomon, just branches off. So Jesus is, in a sense, both his mom and his dad come through David. So Jesus is the king of Israel. He's royalty through David. Plus, he's the son of God. Uh, but what about his brothers? Well, James and Jude, of course, now, again, we stop. Joseph wasn't Jesus' actual father. It was either the supernatural birth, the virgin birth. So Jesus isn't connected to, through the line of the wicked kings that got cut off and said, there'll never be one sit on your throne again. So Jesus is not connected to that side, you, he, but he's connected to David through Nathan, Solomon's brother. Does that make sense, what I just said? Because the line of kings was cut off and cursed by the prophets, God announced it, but yet Jesus is related to Joseph through the line. Well, yeah, but Joseph isn't Jesus' father, so Joseph's line of royalty quits because of his ancestors. But yet David's seed is going to sit on the throne forever, so instead of going through Solomon, it detours and goes through Nathan, and that comes through Mary. So Mary, being Jesus' mother, is crucial, according to Luke's genealogy, because Jesus is then in the line of David. But look who else is on the board here. We're not just talking about Jesus has a lineage to David. Who else has a lineage to David? Well, through Joseph, James, and Jude, through, jo uh, through Clophus, going back through the line of kings that were cut off, Mary the mother of James, Clopas' wife, James, Joseph, Simeon, the leader of the church. And then if Salome is Mary's sister, which she is, then James and John are connected to the line of David through the same line that Jesus and James and John are through Mary. So James and Jude are definitely connected to David through Joseph and through Mary. Jesus, only through Mary because he wasn't born naturally. James and John are double descendants of the line of David. These guys come through from Joseph's side. So what you got is a bunch of sons of David right here. I mean, you've got a bunch of people that are in the line of the royalty right there in the disciples. And then you throw in there uh, Mary's aunt, Elizabeth, that she went to visit, had a baby who became John the Baptist. So now John the Baptist is in this line. So it's just interesting. It's not, you know, flagrant in the scriptures, but uh, a good portion of Jesus' close disciples and, and were relatives and were descendants of David from through the line of David, which is just 
nothing to do with our story tonight, but they are sticking these ladies' names in our face again here. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, who married Joseph's brother, and Salome, Mary's sister, with sons that were descendants of David, bought spices so they might go and anoint him. Uh, so they, they're buying the spices. They probably bought them early that morning. And what they're doing is, as you know, they, they put the body in a tomb, and then they'd wrap it or cover it with spices so the spices would, uh, you know, we think about what, what you know, incense or uh, what the oils or you have, thing. we have this thing right here. Tony, make sure I, it's all, there's a little thing, candle. Tony, make sure it's turned on every day before. She says, is that candle turned on in the, in the family room? I got to turn the light switch on, make sure it doesn't stink in here. You know, so we've got, the, you know, not, yeah, it's just normal. But they would have had, I mean, we're, not, we're, we're just trying to cover up the smell of bacon or whatever in the house. Uh, they've got a dead corpse. I mean, the thing is rotting for a year. And so they're bringing enormous amounts of spices and covering uh, so that they'd kill the, the smell. Nonetheless, that's what they're getting ready to do. So are they thinking resurrection? No, they're thinking about how do we cut down the smell of a rotting, decaying body of the Lord Jesus Christ, which the book of Psalms says he'll not let his Holy One see decay. So it's, it's been right there. This is, he's not going to be there long enough even to begin the decaying process. That's what the Psalms is saying. Um, and again, point three, of course, they didn't have time to get this ready on Friday. They're un, un, it's unanticipated. Chapter 16, verse 2. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. So this tells you the time. And as we go through this whole thing, it appears these women, there's going to be several women appear at the tomb, but they're going to leave their homes uh, while it's dark. They're going to leave before sunrise, no, not at 2 o'clock in the morning, at 3 o'clock in the morning, but, you know, you know how the sun's rising. It's still dark out, but the glow of the sun is coming. By the time they arrive, they arrive at the tomb, the sun has risen. So it can, it's, if you go through people challenging the, the Gospels, they say, well, are the women at the tomb in the dark? Are they at the tomb in the daylight? You know, it's all confusing. No. Uh, sometimes Tony and I get up and run, and we start running in the dark and by the time we get home the sun's in our eyes because it's coming up so we were running in the dark we are running and needed sunglasses well i we are it's confusing when did you run well as the sun was coming up and so that's really that's one of the weak wimpy arguments that people will make against it but they're being very deep they are consistent on this thing on the very and very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen they went to the tomb chapter 16 verse 3 and they were saying to one another, and again, this is Mark, of all the details he could talk about and all the questions we've got, he's telling you, getting you back in the story, what these three ladies were talking about as they're walking early in that morning as the sun was rising, what are they the most concerned about? They're concerned about, we've got these spices, there's a dead body in the tomb, but what are we going to do with the stone, the very large stone? Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And just again, since I've got, I've got this maybe prep for us here. Yes, I do. I think there it is right there. That's that tomb in Galilee. That's, that's from the first century. It's from the very same time as this. Again, they didn't do this type of burial with the, with the osiraries and all except, you know, 50 B.C. to 70 A.D. or 100 B.C. to 70 A.D. So this is from the time of Christ, you know, a few decades before, a few decades after. Then that's a, that's a rolling stone. There's a little trench right here. Then they carved this tomb. There's a trench that, that stone would roll. And it would be cut in a way that it would be easy to roll down. You'd, you'd move a stone or a peg and it would roll down. With real, you know, you'd have to roll it back later on uh, and move it if you had to go in and rebury the body or put it in a ossuary. So they're concerned about the tomb, or the, the stone. Because the remnant, in chapter 15, these same ladies were watching Joseph put the body in and watched him roll the stone in front of the tomb. So they know it's there. How are we going to get in? Um, but they did not know, possibly, and Mark doesn't mention it here, that the closed stone had been marked with a seal because Pilate and some of the, the, the religious leaders were concerned 
that the they the opposition the enemies who buried christ or had him crucified they knew that he had says i will come back alive i will live again so they says ah we see how what's going to happen his disciples are going to come at night steal his body throw it away somewhere and say oh jesus is alive ah, i saw him over there just like we see elvis different places they saw jesus for like many decades you never knew where he was uh, we don't know if hitler's dead i mean when i was in high school hitler was supposed to be still alive selling hot dogs somewhere in iowa or something it's like there's all you know it's like ah oh, he didn't really die well that's what they were afraid so they they, they when they moved it they went up and put a seal on it like you'd seal a, a document with a, with clay or something that they put on there so that if it got broke they could say ah someone broke the seal of it would be illegal to move that so the women don't know that sealed nor do they know that the romans had stationed guards there for that very reason because jesus enemies were more aware of his words and afraid of the words being used against them that the body would be stolen that they sealed it and put roman guards there at the tomb the disciples apparently forgot about the resurrection or spiritualized or something and they're hiding and these women are not thinking we're going to go and find a resurrected Lord. But the, the Pharisees, or the Sadducees, and the religious leaders were concerned about it. Uh, point two, I, I emphasize here again, Mark is not highlighting at this point the supernatural resurrection. Mark is focusing the reader on the natural intentions of the women, the natural obstacles they were facing to accomplish a very mundane, normal burial procedure. This is not the morning of the resurrection. This is the morning we had to get up and buy the spices and get the stone moved and get Jesus' body taken care of. It's not a great day. It's a very mundane, uh, sad day. Chapter 16, verse 4. And looking up as they're approaching it, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. As you can see here, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't try to move the stone while it was there. I just assumed I couldn't move it. Plus, I knew enough not to try, <laughs> which is not always the case. Uh, but they, they really, the, it, the point is, it wasn't uh, just a small stone. Some days you could have a smaller, even a wedge stone. Like it would be big on this side, kind of wedged, almost like a cork that you could slide in especially this opening was smaller then you could pull it out like it was like a, almost like a stone cork they would all, not just be rolling they could plug it up that way but they, they it, it was very large and it was moved so as they approach it they see it something like this is kind of what they saw an open tomb it's like well that's supposed to be closed so of course they're confused why, why is this open who moved this open because the last thing they saw and it would have had to be moved remember what was what was the, until uh sunrise what is this this is the preparation day so someone would have they didn't move it friday night they didn't move it saturday morning saturday evening they had to move it sometime after the sun went down on saturday during the night or early this morning they're the first ones there this doesn't make sense this does not make sense obviously to the ladies uh Point 1a, Mark does not mention, as Matthew did, the earthquake or the angelic visit. Just to give you a flavor from what Matthew writes, same story, Matthew 28, verse 1 through 4. I've got it right there. I'll just read it to you from the English Standard. Now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Now, notice he just mentions two Marys. He doesn't mention Salome. It's like, oh, that's a contradiction. No, he's just not giving you all the information. Neither is Mark giving you all the information. As you're going to see right here, Mary and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Why? For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it so in matthew an angel comes to heaven causing like a theophany occurrence where there's an earthquake shaking of the earth and the angel moves the stone back and if it's this way right here he has me he has me sitting up here on the stone as the women ar arrived and they saw him sitting here now mark's gonna record the angel or the young man in white sitting inside the tomb uh, rolled back the stone and sat on it his appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow and for fear of him the guards trembled and became like dead men and it doesn't say the guards trembled and ran away it says they trembled and became like dead men they just like were paralyzed with fear not knowing which way to run that's what mark re matthew records now had that happened earlier and no one actually saw all the details 
is this the report math you say well that's a contradiction the women don't see the angel sitting on the stone they see an angel or a young man sitting inside look story doesn't correlate well it doesn't say anything about mary and mary seeing this it ex matthew tells you what happened mark tells you they arrived they see this they don't understand what's going on how'd that get moved they're going to go in and see a man a, a sitting a young man in white sitting on one of the burial benches matthew gives you information now does he get it supernaturally by revelation or is he getting information from guess who the guards who saw the whole thing happen they're keeping guard making sure the seal doesn't get broken they're guarding no one steals body else and there's an earthquake things start you know shaking and rattling and then all of a sudden an angel appears descends pushes the stone back and they're like well, you can't touch that they're, they're scared the angel moves the stone and sits on it and they're watching this whole thing take place and uh, if you read in Acts, the same priests who wanted Jesus crucified were against Jesus when they began to proclaim the gospel. Uh, and it, it says very clearly there that these guards got paid off because they came and reported to Pilate what ha had happened. They didn't get killed. The guards, the, the Roman guards guarding this, the angel didn't come down and strike them dead. No, the, the, he just scared them and they're, they watched the whole thing the bible says they went and told Pilate or the priest and the priest says here you just say you fell asleep we'll we'll make it worth your while we'll make sure that no one kills you well right away now you've got a cover-up going just like you know you have all the cover-ups in our government or whatever it's like you can cover up for so long and all of a sudden it's going to come out and uh it, it may have came out right here that uh well what i'm saying in the book of acts when they began to preach the gospel many of the priests came to the faith they they confessed jesus they they said yes we believe it's like why why would you believe it's all it's all a fable it's all made, because we know what really happened it, it's it doesn't say that explicitly but the same people that were trying to cover it up when it comes out they're like they switch sides so you may have the guards telling the story so this is not a contradiction this is just more information did mark or matthew receive this by divine revelation is this what the guard said nonetheless well we have an earthquake an angel i would assume if i'm going to put the story together the angel came down moved the stone back sat on it the guards freaked out got themselves together and scampered away he goes in sits down on the barrel bench waiting for the women to show up because that's where they're going to come look for jesus and that's where the man is when we pick up the story here now in mark um, I, I point out again in point three on uh, chapter 10 verse 4 mark is keeping it this account very natural in appearance although it's very supernatural in the actual and in the detail so mark's just you can see how mark can you can you see that mark is he went very toned down where matthew and and, and john are going to be more uh talking uh, you know giving out some details it's like mark's got a purpose uh after entering the tomb this is they're going to walk into the tomb they saw a young man sitting on the right side dressed in a white robe and were alarmed now this is exactly what we're talking about right here there there's the inside of a tomb on the mount of olives on the side of the mount of olives it's in this picture right here at the base of this if you come down here you can't see because it it's at the bottom of this on the inside these are the niches they would have laid the the uh, possibly slid a body in or they would have put this, uh, the ossuaries in there. But there's a bench. You can see the bench. I'm standing here inside this tomb. You can, uh, there's a bench on this side. It's been carved out. Niches have been carved in, or uh, lo loci. This bench comes over on this side. I'm looking at this bench on this side. It's probably about like this high. And it, goes, it forms a U and comes over this side. So I'm standing in a tomb with a burial bench coming all the way around. Does that make sense? The women go into the tomb where the stones are rolled away, and the angel is sitting, it says, on the right side. Now, if I would understand that if they walk into the tomb, the right side would be, see, the, this is a corner right here. It's going here and then turns and goes this way. And so the angel would be sitting right here, which if you look at this, if you follow tradition, this is what was left of Jesus' tomb after it got crushed. We, we've talked about that. This is the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, this is the burial bench of Christ covered with the marble from, you know, in the, in the 1500s sometime. Below that is another layer. We've talked about that. That was National Geographic had a crew go in. They found a 
like around a crusader time or byzantine i should say another slab of stone when they moved that they found the actual limestone burial bench below that and so that would be the covering of the burial bench that remains and so that would have been it would have been a u-shape like this going around everything else been carved away for different things sometimes constantine carved things out then the crusaders or the the muslims came in and crushed it and this is what you've got right there and again it looks like this so that would be this is what remains of the original stone here original stone there and the original burial benches here here's the 300s ad so yeah 300s uh, with a byzantine cross carved on it so that would be about the same time as you're writing Codex Vaticanus, Codex uh, Sinaiticus, uh, they're covering this up right here. And there's cement, some kind of gypsum cement holding that down. And then this was placed on 1555. The current one was placed on top of it. National Geographic removed both of these and found this. This is new information within the last, say, I don't know, 10 years, I can't tell you, but maybe eight years, where they've actually got an insight of what's going on in there because otherwise it was just covered up. But the angel is sitting, like if we'd say this again, the angel is sitting right here. If you walk into the tomb, you'd have a U-shape. He's sitting on this side, right where Jesus had been sitting, if, if I'm understanding that correctly. And this is an actual tomb that hasn't been preserved. It's still there. Uh, nothing special about it except archaeological purposes. He would be, see, walk into the tomb, like I did right here. There's the right side. The angel would be sitting right there. So that, whoa, let's see if we can get a picture right there. There we go. All right, close enough. All right, so bottom of page two, chapter 16, verse five. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Several things are not going right. The stones move back. They walk in. There's not a dead body there. They're looking for the body. They got spices. We're here to take it. And now there's a live guy, a living guy. I mean, it's early in the morning. It's not like him and his friends are out here, you know, having a party. Uh, they're not out here like, who are you? You're just sitting here. White, it doesn't say it's an angel. That would have freaked him out even more. They saw a young man sitting on the right side. You can see, again, J Mark is writing this very natural and you're adding all the details. You, 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 I even say it. Uh, the young man sitting on the right side, and I don't even say young man, I say an angel. I just rush to that conclusion because we know that's not a young man. That's an angel. The white clothes are the brilliance, the glory of the angelic presence. Dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And again, I write these things. A woman walked into the tomb, and on, on one of the benches, a young man was sitting right side dressed in white. The women were alarmed to see the young, a young man. They're alarmed because they expected a tomb to be blocked shut. They expected the tomb to hold the body of a dead man, Jesus, and not to see a living. They didn't expect to see a living young man dressed in white sitting in a tomb. There I've got the same pictures on the page that I showed you here. And he said to them, and so they walk in, and they've got the spices. There's three of the women there. Uh, they follow Jesus. Their, their cousins are, are you know, aunts of, of Jesus. They, they know details about this whole ministry. They walk in, and the story's not over. It's like, we're here because it didn't work out. He, he died. We're here to honor him in burial. Uh, and the angel, or the young man, uh, informs them, do not be alarmed. That's often what an angel says to a person that they're appearing to do not be alarmed do not be afraid because why because when you see an angel you are alarmed you are afraid and possibly sometimes if some people do see an angel they are should be afraid they should be very alarmed because the angel's not bringing uh good news of great tidings of glad joy but in this case uh he says do not be alarmed and one of the reasons he can say do not be alarmed besides the logic of it is uh, this is, you already know all this. If you've been paying attention, you know exactly what's happening here. She's already told you this. Uh, he says, I know you expected Jesus. He doesn't say that, but uh, you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. Do not be alarmed. I know why you're here. You expected to see Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified one. He's dead. You, he should be laying right here. Now, he's not here. Uh, he has risen. He is no longer dead. He has risen. Well, then the obvious question would be, not the obvious, but my question would be, 
then why isn't here to greet his visitors? I mean, how rude is that? You got visitors coming over, and then you leave before they get there. You just you should have just stayed there, and everybody gathered the tomb. Everybody got the story straight, but he's up and out of there before anybody gets there, and, and the story's continuing beyond. We can't even keep up with this. Where where is he? Who's he talking to now? Jesus has risen. He is not here. So stop looking for him. He's not here. And then he, his evidence, his archaeological or apologetic evidence is, look, see the place where he lay? I'm sitting here. Does not look like he's here anymore. See, I didn't take him. No one took him. He's risen. See the place where they laid him. Uh, and again, the empty space on the burial shelf on the, on the other side, or not the other side, I think he's sitting on the very spot where Jesus had been laid, if Jesus laid on the right. Especially since the, the church of the Holy Sepulchre has the right bench remaining as Jesus' burial spot, assuming there was a, a whole burial bench going around, that would be where Jesus was bar- or laid and where the angel had, or the young man was s- seated. Uh, and point, uh, point two, uh, and you can decide, but this is as close to saying resurrection or describing Jesus as having risen from the dead as Mark gets. He's all, he's just kind of, he's not here, he's risen. Uh, it's like, what do you mean risen? Re- what does this even mean? It's not like, well, you know, like we know. When someone says resurrection, when I say we will be resurrected in the future, there's a day when we will die but we will someday be resurrected, not just in eternity like live again. We'll be resurrected in our physical bodies and live again. That is the Christian message. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, the physical resurrection. We are going to go away, but on the day of the glorification, we will come back in our bodies and be just like Jesus, not with this mortal body, but this mortal body resurrected into a eternal body a, a eternal physical body we're not going to go to some ghostly state in fact jesus points that out um but again they're they're hearing this for the first time um chapter 16 verse 7 but go tell his disciples and peter that he is going before you in galilee there you'll see him just as he told you So several things, I've got them written down right here. The young man gives the women direction or commands, imperatives, go. And again, within this is the gospel message. This is one of the things that we are to do. Once you've accepted Christ, you've understood the message, now you are, as they they were, go. Then they were supposed to tell. We're supposed to tell the world about the good news. Uh, They're supposed to tell who? the disciples again that that's another question the women are the first ones at the tomb where are the men i mean are they are are they sleeping are they getting coffee are they hiding because they don't want to get killed you know first day of the week they're gonna start killing now jesus disciples uh that's i mean that's what i would be i mean if you just killed jesus no one can work on the sabbath i mean i'm not i'm not sure if i'd still be in jerusalem except it's the sabbath you can't leave you got to wait I'd be packing my, I mean, I would think I'd be packing, if I didn't understand it, I'd be packing my bags ready to head to Egypt or something. But the women are the ones going to the tomb. The disciples, uh, they're not, well, if you read John, the women are going to go report to the disciples who are in a room hiding with the door locked. And when they hear this, Peter and John take off running to the tomb to see it. And they have that, their own experience at the tomb. Uh, but go tell, the, the, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Meaning he, he, he wants to meet you in Galilee, and he eventually will. There you will see him just as he told you. You will see, and it was told. It, this, everything that's taking place, Jesus told you it was going to happen. And we've got to be careful because there's things that Jesus has revealed to us through the scriptures, for example, I was talking yesterday about the great delusion that is coming. Uh, it, it's going to come. There's a great delusion. If it's, if it's temporal or uh, periodical every once in a while in history, cultures go into darkness. Or if it's going to be the great delusion at the end where the truth is just lost. And if, if we don't have the truth, you're going to have to go with the deception. And we're in an age now where we're going to have to take, be, pay very close attention to what we've been told already. I mean, just this story. I mean, you understand 
how easy it would be to attack the story, to disprove the resurrection, to prove through artificial intelligence the reality of some other religion or scientific whatever that would just make Christianity look like, like we talked about yesterday, just like child's play, just mock it like it's a child's game. And when you're standing in that world, if you haven't understood what has been told, embraced what has been told, accepted it as fact, even to the place where now it sounds like it's a lie, and you're saying, no, I've, I've, I've heard this clearly. I understand this. And now you've painted this into the image of a lie of deception. I'm not changing. I know whom I have believed. And when this is all lost and confused and in darkness, and you make it run scientific tests and do public polling and all the different things you do and say, hey, look, this isn't even true, you have to be at a place, not because you're deceived, but because you've done your research during the time of light, when there is light shining, when there's truth available, when this light is extinguished, truth remains, it's just going to be hard to see. I mean, just imagine, I mean, wherever you're at in, in life, if it's personal or if it's political, no matter what side you're on, you know, the media, the podcast, situations, family history, family traditions, you wait long enough, things get confused. And you, you lose the truth. We can see the truth today. The Bible says there's a great delusion coming that if you don't have the truth, you're going to go for this. I think we have to be ready. I think I have to be ready so that when it's no longer provable, I think we can prove this. We're, we're looking at pictures. We've got evidence. We've got textual proof. We've got historical proof. We can argue the apologetics. We can argue this is, this is factual. This is the only way it can happen. When you no longer can do that, doesn't mean it's a lie. That means you've lost the light. It means it's still true, but you're going to have to be called a liar. You're going to have to be called a fool. You're going to be called deceived. And if you're not stable in this, you're going to collapse. Does that make sense? And that's kind of, that's kind of you know, I think it's very important today is to make sure that while we're here in the light, that we're in the truth, that we embrace that, we surround ourselves with it. So when deception comes, and we've got no argument except... I know in my heart. Now, I, I, we're not talking about, I just believe, I believe. I mean, we've got factual proof. Now, when you start telling me I'm deceived, I know I've got factual proof, or at one point had factual proof. Uh, but nonetheless, they were told, and uh, let me go back to the notes here. Go, tell his disciples, tell Peter, tell them Jesus is going to Galilee, just th- and there you'll see him just like he told you. And when they're told that information, just like uh typical again and not to blame the women there said go and tell instead of going and telling disciples it says in chapter 16 verse 8 and this would be the closing of the book of mark if you reject verse 9 to the end this is the last verse of the book of mark which may be a good reason to reject it as the last verse it's either a great clever artistic closing or it's not the closing we need the rest of the verses but here it is when they are told go tell disciples and they went out of the tomb they fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them so they go out of the tomb they flee from the tomb and they're seized by trembling and astonishment and said nothing to anyone why because they were afraid it's like they see this and they run from the tomb they flee from the tomb they're overcome with too much information and what who you got i I ain't said i have no idea what's going on they're totally confused and it's like well they they should have had more faith in that (laughs) well uh where that's that's the point of the book I think possibly. That's why this could be a good ending. And now you're in Rome. You're a believer. Nero's persecuting Christians when this book is being written and Mark is writing to the believers in Rome. Uh, they're, they're being put on poles dipped in tar and lit up on fire. They're being fed to animals for entertainment purposes. They're being persecuted, whatever. And it's like, what is happening? Well, that's where the, it's like, that's, 
the story's true, there was more than they could handle. And in Roman 64 AD, 65, they'd killed Peter. Peter had been crucified upside down. Paul was going to be executed next, 67, 68 AD, fall or spring of, uh, of 67, 68 AD. It's like they're, they're killing the apostles. What is happening? Do you understand the story? And Jesus says, if they persecute me, they'll persecute you. It doesn't make sense, but do you have the information? And so at that point, that's, a, again, a clever ending for the book, uh, not saying that is the end. Because you do have uh, a testimony of Jesus' resurrection, a promise that he will appear to the disciples in Galilee. So, do you believe this? Uh, Matthew and Luke and John all confirm that. And also, so does the end of the book of Mark, if we were to go with that. Uh, a couple things, just, in, just I got I to say this, which is just interesting. And again, this is not a, 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 a feminist statement or, you know, uh, trying to jump on the woke wagon at all, because I've been saying this way before woke was awake. Um, <laughs> but it's just flat out interesting to me. Again, just, it's like, what are you saying? I'm just telling you the facts. You've got Jesus' disciples. You've got the men that Jesus has chosen. You've got Peter, who's the leader of the church in the early days. I mean, you know, and then, they, then Paul goes into the Gentile world. And James becomes the leader of the church of Jerusalem. But you've got the men that Jesus has taken with him, <coughs> gone privately with them, taught them, told them, Here's what's going to happen. He told him in Caesarea Philippi. He told him the week before. He's been telling him over and over. The Son of Man is going to die. He's going to be handed over to the Gentiles. They're going to mock him, spit on him. They're going to crucify him. But on the third day, he's going to rise from the dead. And they go, hmm. I wonder what that means. And they pondered, and they pondered, tried to figure out, we're going to go to Jerusalem. We're on our way to Jerusalem, okay? And then we're going to have, we're going to approach the city. He's going to be declared king, and we're going to set up the kingdom. We should ask for positions. So James and John go, can we sit on your right and on your left? He says, you don't even know what you're asking. Can you drink from the cup I can drink from? I have to drink from? Yes, we can. Say, well, you're going to have to, but I can't give you the, the, those positions. Jesus, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed, handed over to the Gentiles, be mocked and spit and crucified. And after three days, I'll be resurrected from the dead. And they heard him say, because they, they, they already knew he's the Messiah. He's the king of the Jews. He's going to establish the kingdom. And he's going to th overthrow the Roman Empire. That's, what, that's even what the angel told Mary. That he'll be mighty on the throne of his father, David, and... Uh, uh, and he'll, he'll, uh, he'll lead the kingdom in righteousness. And, and it's like, but a sword is going to pierce your heart. It's like, or it's like, and so the, yeah, he will be mighty on the throne of David, but he's going to have to do this work first. There's always this work that has to be done. The suffering servant, the sorrows of man. The disciples were, would hear this, but the only thing they would hear is the crown. You're going to be the king of the Jews. Well, yeah, when I, when I come back in glory, I'm going to judge all the nations. The nations will be gathered to me. I'm going to judge the nations. And, uh, and when the kingdom comes, uh, you'll rule with me. Okay, we heard that. We, we heard this. Okay, so we're going to go to Jerusalem now, and I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be killed. We don't understand that. Does that mean you're going to have the crown? Well, so when Jesus is crucified... The men don't understand it. This, this, this cross, the prophecy of the cross that Jesus told, becomes a huge question mark. They think they've lost. They think they chose the wrong Messiah because there have been many Messiahs before and after. Guys come up and have different political plans, going to solve this problem or solve that problem, fight this war. You had the Maccabees. You're going to have uh, Bar Kokhba and 132 is going to show up. You're going to have Messiahs before the rub roar of the 66 to 70 A.D. war. Uh, it just sure looked like this was the right one. And then he got killed. 
So disciples are right here. But the women are the ones, just out of responsibility, uh, they didn't go to the tomb to wait for the resurrection. They went to the tomb, went to, the tomb to honor the dead, to, to put spices on the dead body. So it's not like, oh, the women had great faith. The women are totally, when they says go tell them, they didn't. They didn't tell anyone. They're like, I'm totally lost. The women are the same place. They're confused. So, I mean, there's no one here, there's no, in a sense, hero or un, someone that understands this. But what I'm going to say is the angel who was sent by God told the women, you go tell my disciples and Peter to go to, to Galilee and to meet me there. They gave, gave the women directions to tell the men where to go. So God's word went from the angel to the women to go tell the great disciples, the men. And now you're going to get the idea, you know, like, again, you got verses where Paul tells Timothy, I do not let a woman usurp authority over a man. I, I do not let a woman teach a man. A, a woman should learn in quietness and submission. There's those, but at the same time, you've got the book of Romans, who is, sent, is written by Paul in 57 AD and sent to Rome and carried, we went over this before, by Phoebe, who's a woman, a deaconess from a church, and she would have carried the letter, and when it was delivered, it would have been possibly, the, the role of the one that carries the letter was to read the letter to the people, which would be the leaders of the church, and then because she was the last one or the reader was the last one to see the writer, do you have any questions? And maybe I can explain because we talked before I brought the letter. So she'd be like, well, you know, that, that spokesperson always stands up and talks for Biden. It's always like, you know, with that press conference and she, she never says anything. That's what, that's what you know, that's what, you, there, she's the spokesperson. So Phoebe would have been the one who brought the letter. I'm just saying there's, there's this tension going on where you've got some quotes right there about the role of women, but you've got the women giving the disciples instruction. You've got Phoebe carrying one of the, the greatest epistles probably reading it it's just there's there's something going on there uh more than just women sit down and be quiet because these women were told to go and tell not just the world but the very disciples that were going to start the church which i guess what uh, nothing else there's just some freedom in that. There's just, it's just like, it's not like this brick wall. There's, there's, gotta, there's a little bit of, why is that happening? And you, I, you can give reasons and stuff why it's happening. But the very fact that it's happening means you can't be so closed-minded uh, on, on this issue. Now, that doesn't mean I'm woke by any means because... Good God, that, there's, there's, that wokeness is a decaying of a culture. This is the way God is dealing uh, with his disciples. That, that's, that's, I spent way too much time on that. I just thought it's interesting to point that out as you go by it. Um, because the women are so, in, well, right here. You've got uh, this right here on the last thing. I'm out of time. But these are all the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection you can see that many of them are, are with uh, women i don't you know that there's seven or something like this where the women are mentioned but uh that's all the appearances of jesus uh you've got one two three four of them in mark only one in the verses we talked about tonight to mary mary and salome the others are going to be in mark 16 verses 9 to the end verse 20 there but all of those are also repeated in luke john and acts so again there's nothing new in those but that's fun to look through that list because those are all the times that jesus appeared after his resurrection that's recorded in scripture and i would say this also that doesn't mean these are the only times jesus has ever appeared that means these are the times that were recorded in scripture so what am i saying jesus i'm just saying these are the ones recorded in scripture and it doesn't mean jesus can't appear to someone if it's not recorded in scripture because it's been 2000 years since scripture is recorded and that means jesus hasn't appeared to anyone for 2000 years i'm not saying he has i'm just not saying i'm saying <laughs> who's to say he can't who's to say he can't uh, he appeared to paul or uh what one of, one of those you, you're going to miss 
is uh, Paul was in the temple in Acts 22, and he was in prison in Caesarea in Acts 23, where the Lord, and people don't even talk about it, where the Lord appears to him. Not in a vision, not in a dream, but the Lord walked in on him and talked to him and gave him some instructions. Says, okay, just like you, you testified about me here, I'm going to take you to Rome, and you're going to testify about me in Rome. And it's, how, how do you know that? Well, the Lord showed up and told me. And there's been other, that's not counting angelic visitations. So that's just kind of interesting. Uh, I, I'm teaching the text of Scripture. I'm not, this, this has no point, anything except, interestingly, they're being told, go tell the men. But make sure you say you're sorry that you're a woman telling a man. <laughs> said, none about it, just go tell them, go tell them. Okay, <clears throat> that was not the point of the whole message tonight by any means. Next week we'll finish up the book of Mark, maybe, but of course that's never a promise. Father, we thank you for the chance to look into these things. We thank you for your word. We ask again that we would humble our hearts, that we would allow the word to transform our life, allow your spirit to lead and guide us in the truth, that just like we see the disciples having preconceived ideas and, and misunderstanding things because they understood, they thought already what was going to take place, we also want to humble ourselves and allow your word to lead us and your spirit to lead us to the truth and to see things the way you want us to understand them and the things that you're actually doing. Uh, Father, we do again thank you for this opportunity to study the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for being here.